Welcome to this recording of the NMRA PCR Coast Division Saturday virtual event, recorded January 23rd, 2021. Uh, so welcome all. Uh, this is our, uh, our January 23rd meeting. Uh, so we actually had three things, just a quick introduction, and we actually started some of the introduction talk before we, we actually started the meeting. Um, and George Carpenter is going to talk about his photo selection from the north, and then we'll close with bring what you're modeling. Uh, so very quickly, I put this slide in. We were just talking about it. Um, there has been an announcement of the cancellation of Rails by the Bay, the 2021 NMRA convention here in Santa Clara. Um, I did want to put up, this was not the text of the announcement of the cancellation, but the planning that's there. And Seth was just talking about that he is leading the planning for a substitute video virtual event from a technology perspective. Um, it'll be July 6th, as you can see there, um, working with the NMRX team. Uh, the next paragraph basically shows you um, if, if you have registered, or its registration is $49 for the event. Um, if you've registered, you can donate that, use it to cover the fee or get a full refund if you already paid a registration fee. So um, those of you that have registered, that's the way to resolve it. If you didn't get this, uh, this email, send me an email and I'll make sure you get it. And that'll actually be one of the points I want to talk about in just a moment around getting emails. Um, I, I have not heard an update about the Fresno Convention. Um, the February 20th is still, as I understand it, the decision date. Um, we'll certainly update everyone if I hear anything more. Uh, and by the way, if anyone has any updates on that, feel free to blast it out. Um, from a Coast Division perspective, we had a board meeting on Monday, January 18th. Um, very, very short meeting. Um, didn't really cover much because obviously we're not having any events or anything. There's not a lot of general activity. Uh, based on current data, we're not going to start planning a physical event until the fall. So we're looking at the potential of trying to do something in the fall, my assumption would be probably around October, November would be the time frame. Um, we have one challenge there that we have to think through. Um, the Boy Scout building that we have traditionally used for two of our meetings every year um, is for sale because of the Boy Scouts um, issues, um, legal issues. Uh, so we probably have lost access to that facility, and that was actually a less expensive facility to use. Um, so we will probably look at the, uh, at the um, Helks in, in Alameda, potentially, if we can, for that October-November event. But we're going to have to start looking for other physical locations. We may have to rethink. So one of the things that we may want to do is um, get a group together as a planning committee for our physical events and break that out to begin planning how we move forward because of our loss of one of our two physical facilities. Um, until then, we'll continue biweekly events. These are, are booked online through June, I think. Uh, we'll put, continue to put these on probably through the remainder of the summer. Um, we did <laughs> talk a bit about elections. We are seeking volunteers for clinic chair and photo model chair. Um, I think we, we have uh, some folks that are willing to take on the photo model, but really would Love to have someone take on working with the, on the clinic chair. And I think that actually based on post the convention probably be really good because a lot of the clinics there we can probably reuse. So contact either Phil or myself or Dave Connery if you're interested. Um, elections, uh, we're going to have elections in early March. Uh, we discussed either using this virtual event to do the elections or using election buddy like the PCR. Um, and that's a decision we'll need to make in another week. The concern was if we had an election only on the virtual event, would people be upset that they weren't able to vote? So we need to get together and resolve that. Just a, a question, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. A question to the group, is anyone really, is everyone here comfortable with doing this online or should we do it through election buddy? Is there anyone, maybe my, everybody's pretty my comfortable? My two bits are, it's doing it online works fine as long as we do everything we can to facilitate other members having access. And that's basically it, the education process that we so, just well, talked I, about. I actually had a thought process, and it's going to take a volunteer, and it's not a hard job. But if someone is willing to be a volunteer as the <laughs> absentee ballot counter, 
basically my thought was we could announce this and we could say, if you can't come email your vote and we can put a little thing, a form to get email a vote to the volunteer. All you have to do is on Friday night, you know, say the last time you can vote is nine o'clock Friday night. So Friday night at nine o'clock, take all the emails, count the votes, and then just input those to the meeting on Saturday morning. So anyone who votes remotely essentially can vote by email and it can be counted. That, that was a thought of how we could do it this way because we've normally done our elections at our physical meetings, quite frankly. So anyone who didn't come to a physical meeting really couldn't vote anyway. A anyway, anybody who has any thoughts on that, send me an email. We we're going to decide over the next week what's the right path. And, and if they don't like what the vote comes out, we'll just all go to Darn Phil's house. Well, yeah, yeah. By, by the way, if you don't like, if you, if you, if anyone doesn't want me in this role, please volunteer to replace me. No, I'm just teasing. I, you know, it's, it, and by the way, the, the current three, we, we vote on three officers and the current three officers are, have all agreed to continue. So that's basically what we're voting on. And okay, let me go back to my, my share here. So the last thing is I've gotten two or three emails from folks that have asked me to change their emails on the emails I send out and I can do that. The problem is I get an email list that's basically an Excel database of membership every three months from uh, the NMRA, it comes through the PCR to me. That has the email that's in the NMRA database. Um, the best way, if you wanna change your email, change the email in the NMRA database. If you, want, if you don't know how to do that, I actually wrote some instructions up to one member you basically go up there, it takes about three minutes if you have an account. Once you have an account on the NMRA, it takes a couple of minutes to go change it. But once you've changed it there, it automatically changes it for all the NMRA emails, emails, all the PCR emails from Chris. And then the next time I get the database, it'll change automatically for the emails I send out. So uh, if you'd like to change the email to a new email, um, uh, go ahead and send me an email. I can send you the instructions. If you are comfortable doing it, contact me and I'll do it with you because um, that's the best way to do it. Um, and that's really all I had um, to talk about today, I think. Now, why am I? Um, oh, last thing is just join the NMRA. Uh, so with that, I'm going to switch over to a different topic, which is our presentation for the day. Um, so this is actually a, a very interesting discussion. George stepped forward and said, hey, I'd like to talk about what I've done in terms of modeling and his specific interest in Canadian model railroads and has been collecting photos for a number of years and is now digitizing them. So what George is gonna do is talk to us a little bit about his both modeling passion, but also the collection he's built. So with that, with George, um, I'm hoping you're on and I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm just going to be the slide meister. I am on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, you want to start with that? Uh, I, I guess go to the, there we go. Yeah. Uh, let me just start by saying a few things about myself. Uh, I grew up in Kinsella, Alberta, Canada, where my father was the uh, Canadian National uh, st uh, Station Agent. I hate to do this, but can you turn your camera on? I thought it was on. Hold no, on. it's actually not on. Hold on, let me get my son to do that. I don't know anything about that. Okay, because it'd just be better that we can see you. We'll, we'll start again. Okay. Jim, Jim, can you help me? Sorry about that, guys, but it just, it, it's nicer we can, it's going to, you know, see him, so. Yeah, that, yeah and it, it, it's not like George, done. and George George works for SRI, so it's not like he's uh, technical or anything. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, we had it on, he and I had a had a video call, went through some stuff a couple of days ago, it was on, so. Oh, you got to I, I, nice start video. Oh. Here, we'll sit down, click on it. No worries. We're going to start all over again, George. We're going to, I'm going to click it back to the beginning. I'm going to redo the intro. Oh, there we go. There we are. Okay. So now I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to re, we're going to restart. We're going to, this is that production values stuff that, um, 
that um hang on i'm not sharing my screen am i there we go okay let me start this up so today we're going to have a, a great talk by George Carpenter. Um, George um, basically reflects his love of Canadian railroading and an incredible set of pictures he's, picked, he's, he's chosen and put together. And is going to talk to us today about that and um, his passion for transportation in the North. So with that, uh, George, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, you want to go to that front? Uh, there. There we go. Yeah. Uh, as I started out saying, I'd like to say a few words about myself to start. Uh, I grew up in uh, Kinsella, Alberta, Canada, uh, where my father was the CNR, Canadian National Railway, um, station agent. In fact, that top picture, that's my father standing there by uh, express wagon. And I'll talk about the pictures here. The picture on the lower left is a, probably the first picture I ever took about 1944 or 1945. It's a uh, uh, 3,500 CNR engine leaving uh, the water tank, blowing the cylinders. And the picture on the lower right, we'll talk about at the end. Uh, as I said, uh, my father was the station agent there from uh, 1937 to 1963 when he turned 65 and was forced to retire. And uh, Kinsella is about a hundred miles east southeast of Edmonton on the uh, uh, Viking sub, uh, which is on the main line from Winnipeg to Edmonton and was originally the Grand Trunk Pacific a line that went through town there about uh, 1911. Population is uh, less than 100, uh, even if you count the cats and dogs. Uh, the big deal, though, in Kinsella was it was the largest gravel pit for CNR in Western Canada. And it was very uh, kind to my father with all the overtime it provided. And it was very kind to me because uh, uh, it paid for my first two years in university. Uh, when I was uh, seven or eight years old, I started spending all the time I could riding in the locomotive, steam locomotives in the pit, you know, for hours each day. So I, I got a lot of steam engine time. And uh, those, uh, and they were small locomotives like uh, 260s and 280s because the rail was very light. In fact, it was skeleton track sitting on top of the ground because it had to be moved all the time to keep up with uh, the, the gravel bank being eaten away. Uh, I worked uh, for Canadian National for four summers while I was going to university. And uh, the first summer, uh, I was put in charge of the gravel pit. So I was very close to home. Uh, you want to show the next slide, Phil? No. Nope. Okay. I was, okay. Uh, yeah, I started, uh, well, after I graduated, I went to uh, California here to Stanford for graduate school and forgot all about railroading. But about 1970, I kind of missed railroading and, and, you know, we didn't take a lot of pictures at home or when I was working for the railroad. So I started looking around to see if there were photographs. and. Uh, Starting about 1970, I started buying anything that was available. So I currently uh, have somewhere between 35 and 40,000 photos of uh, CN mostly and other Canadian railroads. And there's a few US things mixed into there. Uh, Phil has shown 
uh, the start of three lists that I've given him, which we can go into a lot later, but there's one for steam locomotives, one for diesel locomotives, and one for everything else like passenger, maintenance away, revenue cars. And uh, I love Canadian grain cars, cylindrical cars. So uh, they're all on one of those lists. Uh, next slide, Phil. Okay, this is uh, something that I love dearly. This is a, a heart Otis or Otis heart. I tried to look up Otis in, on the Google, but couldn't find anything about them. I'm pretty sure they were a US company. Uh, this car called a heart car, and I had probably about 250 of them in the, in the gravel pit, but it's a, it's a kind of a unique car. It uh, can be configured for center dump and it can be configured for side dump. And as I said, the, the gravel pit was uh, full of them all the time during the summer from about April to October. And uh, as you might realize, uh, the summer in Canada, uh, the days are extremely long, like about 21 hours a day. So, you know, loading cars, moving cars, dumping cars, we're taking, you know, almost, we're, we're happening almost around the clock. Uh, the bill, you, you can see in the upper left, right up below the top rail there is the builder's plate. And I wish I could zoom in on that and read it, but I can't. Um, as I said, it was built in 1928, but it's been sort of refurbished and renumbered. I don't, I mean, the, the numbers have gone from five digits to six digits. Uh, five digits always used to be maintenance of way and six digits is revenue car. So I don't know whether the upgrade turned this into some kind of revenue car used by customers or not. Now the, uh, the, yeah, as I said, in my day, they were all 90,000 cars. Uh, the, the uniqueness of this car is that there's a big hole in the floor uh, from the trucks on one end to the trucks on the other end. In fact, you can see on the bottom side of this, there's sort of a hopper arrangement with a, a periodic series of wood or metal blocks in there for the closing. Uh, uh, the, uh, the hole in the floor is, as I said, from truck to truck, and the width of that hole is uh, somewhat wider than uh, half the width of that car. And, and that's basically a, a wood floor with uh, timbers running uh, lengthways, probably uh, about three inches thick. Uh, see, and notice all that uh, complicated uh, uh, that pipe running from one end of the car to the other on the side and hooks on the top and hooks on the bottom, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, let's see the next uh, slide, Phil. Phil? Oh, that's okay. That's just another one of them. Uh, next one. Yeah, Here, here's a dilapidated old a Northern Alberta railway car in one of their museums, but it shows the, the interior of the car. And unfortunately it's the only one I've got. You can see the two door, two doors in, in the middle of the floor. Each one of them has got uh, seven hinges on it. And for uh, side dump operations, those two doors are closed. But for a center dump, the two doors, you lift the, up from the center 
and lean them back against the sides of the car. And that forms a hopper to bring gravel in from the sides into the hole in the floor. And uh, you see the, the gate at the end, that's at the end of the, the, uh, the hole. Uh, there's still another five or six feet to the end of the car where the trucks are underneath. And you can see the, the near doors lying on the floor and it normally would be standing up vertical and along the sides of the car at the top is hardware to uh, hold those doors in place. And then in, in that first slide I showed you, the doors were at the far end and that, that was never the case in normal operation. So maybe the, these are some kind of commercial revenue cars now. Um, what else about this? Oh, uh, in the very front of this, you can see one, two, three, four hinge spots right uh, at the very front of that car. For um, side dump, there was a big metal plate hinged at those four places. And the, the metal plate uh, carried over to the, uh, the car in front of it so that you could pull a, a, a big plow through these cars. And I'll show you that later too. Okay, the next slide. Okay, I only showed you half the car here because uh, as I say, there's uh, the side doors are all hinged at the top and that top rail. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hinges on this section of the wall. And uh, the pipe there about two thirds of the way down from the top, uh, there's, there's two on each side and you can see they meet at the middle which is on the extreme right side of this photo. Uh, and, and in this photo, there's one, I think there's uh, five, uh, hicks, uh, uh, hooks uh, <coughs> hanging down from uh, metal wall, metal pipes that are part of the frame of the car. So those are permanently uh, mounted there. And down below them, there's eight hooks pointing up. The top hooks are pointing down, the bottom hooks are pointing up, and then there's a set of chains uh, coming down from the top and, and up from the bottom that are all connected to that center pipe. And uh, the, the chains from the top are wound around the pipe in one direction and the chains from the bottom are wound around the pipe in the other direction. And then over on the extreme left here, you can see that the end of that pipe has a uh, shepherd's crook on the end of it. And there's a movable bar that's hinged down near the bottom of the car that holds that pipe in place, it keeps it locked, keeps the car locked. The, the configuration that you see there right now is in the locked position. And, uh, and uh, uh, when these are being unloaded side dump, uh, a, a team of men come along with little crowbars, hit that uh, lock bar and uh, unload uh, that the pipe then will drop down into the lower hooks and that frees up the walls and they will uh, rotate out from the side and allow um, gravel to come out each side of the car. And by the way, during the unloading uh, in both the center dump and the side dump, the train is moving at a slow walk. So these men are moving around on the ground and on the cars, uh, adjusting these pipes and allowing the uh, uh, gravel to drop out either through the bottom or uh, in the side configuration out through the sides. Okay, the next. 
Now, strangely enough, I, I can't remember his name, one of the rail fans in Ontario uh, went to a company called Shapeway and had uh, a model computer printed. I bought a couple of those and they weren't cheap. Seemed to me, I paid for two of them like 150 bucks. But I was astounded that this particular car is available as a uh, uh, kit, kit built model. Uh, and, and my two copies of that car now are back at my painter in Ontario. So I'm looking forward to having something to remember uh, living in that gravel pit for a couple of years. The next slide. Uh, this is an actual Marion steam shovel that was in the Kinsella pit in the very early days. And you can see that uh, 20 plus foot uh, cliff of gravel behind it. And you can see it took two, four, six, eight, nine people to run it. It was kind of a marvel. I would sit in the cab of those uh, steam engines while they're loading. And uh, this uh, steam shovel would uh, be on temporary track uh, next to the, the cliff. And uh, only part of this that moved is the boom and the shovel. The, the uh, uh, unit itself only moved periodically like every five minutes or something like that. And uh, the uh, would rotate on that stand behind the first man on the left and it would uh, reach over to the, the bank, fill up that bucket, wheel around and drop it into a heart car and it went on uh, like clockwork, uh, like it was computer generated. I mean, it was just a marvelous, uh, just nonstop. And uh, uh, we would load something like uh, 100 cars a day along that cliff. You know, that, that cliff would be close to a mile long. Uh, it took a lot of men, cost a lot of money, a lot of overtime. So that was uh, replaced in the late 40s, early 50s by a tracked uh, diesel shovel, uh, which lasted maybe 10 years, uh, but was uh, somewhat unreliable. And that was followed by rubber tired front end loaders uh, that closed out the pit in 1960. The next uh, photo. This looks rather nondescript and it's not very well focused, but this is the key to unloading side dumps. See the, uh, the heart car there between the, the ledger wood and this nondescript uh, work car. You can see the yoke of the big plow that is uh, pulled through the uh, heart cars to unload side dumps. And I'll show you another picture of the, I don't know, have you ever heard of the word Lidgerwood? Yeah. But it's a big cable puller. And uh, so when they're getting ready to dump side dump, uh, this plow in that car would be placed at one end of the loaded train. The Lidger would be, would be placed at the other end. And this nondescript car you can see on the top of it is a, a pole up there. Uh, the locomotive and that car would pull up beside the ledger wood and that uh, pole would be rotated around over the front of the ledger wood and the cable on that ledger wood would be connected to that pole and the engine and car would then depart for the other end of the train pulling that cable all the way down to where that plow is. So uh, uh, as I said, the plow would be at one end, the ledger wood would be at the other. <coughs> the locomotive would be behind the ledger wood applying, I'm not sure whether it's uh, 
uh, steam or just uh, compressed air <clears throat> to run that uh, uh, plow. But uh, uh, a group of, uh, well, the train would be set in motion at a, at, a, at a nice walk, comfortable walk. And four or five guys would be climbing on those cars, uh, tripping off the uh, pipe on the side to open up and the plow would come along through the car and over those metal plates between the cars. And uh, eventually all those cars would get dumped out the side. There might be a spreader uh, behind the uh, plow car that would uh, uh, trim up that gravel either in the center dump or the side dump. Uh, and uh, uh, off they'd go back to the terminal and uh, those cars would head back to the gravel pit. So these cars don't look very impressive, but they're the whole key to dumping those uh, side uh, dump hard cars. And this picture was taken in uh, uh, North Edmonton uh, yard. Uh, they probably had two or three trains going out to the branch lines and the main line. I actually saw uh, a train of side dump cars being dumped near uh, Kinsella. It was a very fascinating scene to see how everybody knew what they were doing and how that gravel got out of there so smoothly. Uh, the next slide. Phil, yeah, here's here's a picture of an actual uh, uh, Lidgerwood, uh, and that's uh, a commercial company. They used to make uh, lots of they they made units for pulling in uh, timbers from forests and stuff like that, and for the marine industry. But that big wheel, which they've uh, pulled up out of that Lidgerwood, with the uh, uh, hoist. Uh, they probably could run off two or 3,000 feet of cable from that uh, winch and then pull that uh, plow through all the cars that are in that train. And the guy standing there is uh, Norman Cornes, friend of mine, uh, who provided a great deal of pictures to me. Uh, I, he may well be dead now. Uh, next, there is that. Yeah, here, here's another Ledgerwood with a, a 35,000 282 engine. Uh, all of all of that group, the S, C, N, uh, uh, put their different locomotives in different classes. This is an S dash two dash A engine, and there were 20 of these, and those engines uh, were frequent on the Viking sub. You'd see three or four of those every day. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, I didn't say earlier, but the, the gravel pit was about a mile square and it was down uh, about 150 feet below the, the main line. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a photo I took in 1961 from our farm. Uh, we had a summer farm uh, down near the gravel pit where we uh, uh, let the cattle run free during the summer. And uh, I was down there back from California in summer of 61, took this picture from down in the valley. And, and the reason it's kind of interesting as I told you earlier, the uh, steam locomotives down in the gravel pit were pretty light. And uh, the best of them could only pull seven or eight full heart cars up the hill of about a 150 foot grade uh, on the siding and make up a train. Uh, when I was in high school, there apparently was a washout somewhere around Edmonton and uh, they needed emergency uh, gravel. So they stopped a mainline freight and uh, took a pair of F7s. And there's an F7 on the front of this locomotive. Uh, they they uh, 
asked it to go down into the pit and pull out a train of cars. Uh, I went with them so I could get them through all the switches and down to the face. And uh, the two uh, F7s, 1500 horsepower each, hooked up to 30 gravel cars and walked up that hill just like there was no train behind it. I was just flabbergasted. So, uh, by the way, that uh, high fill used to be a wooden bridge originally. Uh, next, Phil. Uh, yeah, this is just to show you that other railroads had heart cars too. This is, I took in uh, Battle Creek, Michigan in 1993. I can't read any numbers on that, but uh, the whole side of the yard was filled with them. The next. Uh, this is uh, a Grand Trunk Western uh, train uh, of seven or eight uh, heart cars on the way to dump them, I guess. But it's pretty nice scene. Next. Okay. Uh, so I this said, is probably I'm... more. This is probably me more than than George. So so one of the things George told me was he's scanning all of his photos with a high resolution scanner at a 20 megabyte um, size, which is about eight megapixels, you know, an eight by 10 print. When you go through it, it's about 7.2 megapixels. Um, and so one of the things he's being very adamant about is that, and I, I wanted to show everybody because this is, I think kind of important. When you look at the detail in the pictures you saw, those are actually JPEGs of that resolution. So they tend to retain the same resolution. So if you look on the right here, the right are basically the kind of scans that, that George has done. The next two scans are kind of typical of what you get from a two to four megapixel camera or a um, you know a lower, lower resolution like on your iPhone. And, and what I found was interesting in these pictures was if you look at the bottom of the seven, it actually has a tail on it in the font. It's kind of a unique font in that little tail at the bottom. And what's interesting is when you get down to the two megapixel photo, you really can't see it any longer. So one of the things that George has said is he's really scanning everything at a high resolution. So I thought it was kind of important to understand why that's important. So I'll throw it back to you, George, for kind of talking about um, where you are with your collection. Yeah, I've, I've scanned all 10,000 or so steam photos, and that amounts to about uh, 120 gigabytes of uh, uh, digital uh, files. And uh, I have uh, scanned almost all of what's probably uh, 8,000 uh, photos of passenger cars, uh, maintenance away, cranes and spreaders and all the uh, uh, on-company service cars. I've scanned uh, all of the uh, revenue cars. No, I've still got probably uh, four or 500 yet to finish off the revenue cars. And I said, I love the cylindrical Canadian hoppers. And I've probably got uh, uh, five or 600 of those yet to scan. And there's then another 20,000 diesel photos of which I've scanned at least a thousand or so and uh, we'll probably keep at that. I am still working part-time for the Air Force so I'm trying to juggle all these things and I'd, I'd love to sit there eight or ten hours a day and scan but uh, that's not happening. But you want to go back to those uh, uh, lists, Phil? Sure. Well, as, as I said, uh, I've, I've kind of organized this, and they're all in, in Word files, uh, which I can scan to some extent. I know that you would all love to see them in uh, uh, 
PowerPoint or whatever, uh, Excel spreadsheets. But uh, I've, I've listed the engine numbers, I've listed the classes, I've list, I listed the types, I've commented on the scene, and I tell you what the media is, whether it's a slide or a, a black and white photo or a, a, a color photo. Uh, that's the way I can find them, uh, at least if I know they're a slide or a print. I've got uh, about uh, 25 boxes of slides, uh, 750 in each one. And so that's how I find which box they're in by knowing whether it's a color slide or, or a eight. And most of my prints are eight by 10. I do have smaller. And so uh, these uh, lists are available to anybody that wants them. I think uh, Phil li listed my uh, email address. Yep. Yeah, your email and address I is actually here and I'll put it up in the, in the text. So. So basically, George has these word files. And so, you know, if you're interested in looking for something particular, you can use there's a search function, find function right up here in Word. You can kind of see it on this sheet where my cursor is. So if you're, you know, interested in something, you can use find and kind of search and try to find something specific or just scroll through it. So this is this is Charlie Bedard, uh, George. Good to see you again. Even yeah, if it's only Charlie. electronic. Yeah. So I've I've used uh, George's index, and to be honest, it's fantastic. I, I've been looking. You can see in my background. I've been studying Jeep nines for a while. Uh, I saw a couple of Jeep nines on that uh, shot that you had with the uh, F unit on the front. I thought that was awesome. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, but um, what I was able to do is using his index, I was able to look for a specific location in the area that I'm modeling, uh, the range of uh, years the color schemes um, and even specific unit numbers and class numbers. And uh, uh, like the one behind me, which I'm modeling, you know, George was able to pull out exact, you know, four or five uh, uh, shots from different angles. So I could validate details, color schemes, custom details and so on. So it's, it's an awesome collection. So thanks George for all that work. You're very welcome. Uh, Jeff Reed with a comment. Uh, you said that several railroads uh, used had cars very similar. I'll comment that Santa Fe, which I'm a nutter for, has a bunch of uh, gondolas that they called Caswell that they originally built and they rebuilt them and they look, they're dead ringers for your hearts. That, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they originally used different locking mechanisms that unlocked each gate separately. But when they rebuilt them in Cleburne, they put a solid rod like you talked about on the heart gondolas. Otherwise, and, and so the rebuilt ones are dead ringers to the hearts. Thank you very much for your presentation. Well, I got to love those heart cars and they put me through two years of college. So there you go. It worked out. So anyway, I, wanted could... to jump, I wanted to jump back here for, for George. So, you know, if you're interested in helping George completing the scan. So, you know, it sounds like he's about halfway through and clearly I, the only comment is it does require probably kind of an above Costco grade scanner, not the cheapest kind of scanner to do that. It takes some serious effort to actually get the scans aligned and do them right or, or doing them through um, Photoshop. Um, the other thing, and George is, has, is Linrist is talking to a few different museums and looking at doing, placing the photos of the California State Museum. So if anyone has information on that and is interested in talking to George, please contact him. So back to you, George. Well, I think that winds it up for me. Uh, as I say, I, I juggle between working for the government and working for myself. And uh, I thought I'd have all the uh, miscellaneous cars and what scanned by the end of uh, 2020, but I haven't. It takes me about five, six, or in an extreme case, 10 minutes to, to scan a slide. 
to, I, I mean, I, I insist that everything that is vertical in the scene be vertical in the digital image. So I sometimes, have, I'm lucky I can scan it once or twice and be done, but I've scanned some photos as much as five times before I get everything lined up the way I want it. So I, I can't necessarily insist that anybody else do that, but uh, I guess I, I'm uh, almost 84. I'm not sure I will get all the, the diesel slides scanned, <clears throat> but I'll keep working at it. That's good. Well, with that, um, any, any other questions, comments? Um, I just wanted to ask George, what is the scanner that you're using, or do you have different ones for different uh, types of material? Yeah, I, I bought a, uh, a simple si slide scanner for about 400 bucks, and uh, I found it was too fussy. It took too much time, but I've, I, let me just turn the light on and give you the brand name. It's a V700. For people who oh, are interested, it, it's an Epson V700. It cost me about 700 bucks years ago. I, I'm surprised I haven't worn it out. Nikon makes a cool scan 5 or cool scan yeah, V. And I've got that. That's a relatively inexpensive, really easy to work with slide and uh, 35 millimeter uh, film scanner. Um, the, the thing it that takes I about two minutes to scan. Yeah, oh yeah, the scanning time is trivial. It's the it's the adjustment and and all that that takes the time. Uh, I've found that the the Epson uh, 700 has got a wonderful uh, uh, light adjustment in it that uh, and color adjustment in it that's automatic, whereas that Cool Scan. Uh, you're, it's very fussy. You're going in and you're adjusting the reds and you're adjusting the blues and and you know before you know it you've spent t uh, an hour or, or good part of an hour getting it perfect. Whereas the uh, Epson, that's almost all automatic. I do have to go in occasionally and readjust all the colors, uh, but this can take the dark almost the darkest slide you know, underexposed that you might have in your collection and throw it in there and you can almost light it up to normal uh, very easily. So I, I, I've gone almost exclusively to the Epson as opposed to the, the, the Nikon. Well, thanks, George. That was that was really really cool. It was fun to see your passion for the pictures, and and the thing the thing I found I always find when you look at these things so amazing is how much technology has changed the business of transportation of goods. I, you know, the picture of those nine people standing in front of that steam shovel loading gravel contrasted to the pictures of a modern um, coal mine in Montana where they're talking and taking the top of a mountain off and they've got shovels that are 10 times as large and one person doing the equivalent work of nine people plus. And it's just, it's, it's amazing how, how you can see how much has changed. So I think we really all appreciate that. It's a great view into the past that we often don't think about. Well, you know, I've, I've often thought about, well, I had intended to go back to Canada after graduate school uh, and uh, the railroad offered me a job and I could have been involved in the whole electronic change in everything in the railroading. And, and I'm, I know that would have been a lot of fun, but I didn't. <laughs> well, then you would have been living in the cold of Canada instead of the warm of California too. Well, you know, we Californians treat winter as something you drive to in three hours and come home the same day. We visit weather, we don't live in it. That's great. Well, thanks George and, and everyone, I show George, give George a hand. Thanks much for, uh, for coming and talking with us today.
And Thank you, guys. We'll... Thank you, George. Outstanding. And so with that, I think we'll, we'll close our clinic and uh, we'll go ahead and move into kind of our free for all show what you've been modeling um, section. So anyone who's been modeling anything interesting, it's a great time to uh, tell us what you've been doing. Well, this is not a model of what I've been doing, but um, in talking about those heart convertible cars, they were pretty ubiquitous. Um, a lot of railroads had them as uh, cars to disperse gravel. Uh, Jack Burgess needed some for his uh, YV. They had several. And he worked with Doug Judah to get some done in HO resin kits. They're really nice kits. They can com be configured for either side or center uh, dump. Uh, Doug is uh, one of the principals of San Juan. Uh, who also today owns Grantline. I don't know if those cars are still available, but they were, I think, fairly reasonable. As I recall, they were about 35 or 40 bucks a piece and, and very nice cars. Cool. I guess everybody watched the inauguration and didn't model this week. Unfortunately, the work world has brought my modeling to a grinding halt between the work world and the, uh, the, the, the COVID stuff. But I'm, I am going to get back to modeling. I'm going to finish that damn passenger car, I promise. <laughs> Oh, well. Well, I'm, I'm happy to go. Um, my name's Bob. <clears throat> so I'm really excited to have rejoined the NMRA and, PC, and, and start with the PCR. So I'm modeling the North Coast Pacific Railway. Um, so basically, after not really doing any model railroading for about 20 years, I've cleaned out my garage. I have an 8 foot by 25 foot space along one side. Um, uh, I've designed uh, 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 basically a, a two and a half foot by 12 foot set of modules that are going to represent Occidental in 1900. And I just got wood delivered uh, during the week and I'm about to build, uh, do my bench work. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and uh, my brother who is a tank and slot car and Star Wars cruiser modeler. Um, I got him an NMRA membership for his birthday because all of the, all of the modeling stuff is so uh, ubiquitous to all of the stuff that he does. Um, I saw a fiber optic uh, 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 thing um, that uh, I knew he would be perfect for him because he wires up his Star Wars cruisers with fiber optics. So I expect to see him up on this shortly, and I'm going to uh, commission him to build buildings for my uh, layout once I get to the point where, where I'm there. So I just want to say that um, uh, I'm, I'm re-engaged after about 20 years, and, and you guys have got me all fired up. Uh, best advice I got out of the whole being involved with, with this so far is find a prototype to model. Um, and I'm really enjoying studying the North Coast Pacific Railway, and I got looking online a whole bunch of sources, and so that's that's become a whole lot of uh, of fun for me. So, thanks a lot. Maybe next time I'll be able to show bench work. So, what what, what scale are you in? Uh, on thirty. Oh wow, should be awesome. Yeah. So, um, uh, 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 Morrison did a whole bunch of modeling in in the eighties of, of, uh, of uh, North Coast Pacific Railway. So I basically got the DVD set from Narrow Gauge and Short Line yeah. Gazette and, and loaded it on my laptop. So I'm still working 40 to 50 hours a week, but I have Narrow Gauge and Short Line Gazettes on my work laptop. So when those Zoom calls get slow, I'm doing research. And, and I found that um, the, the, the DVD collection was one of the best 150 bucks uh, I ever spent. Um, because it, it's full of, I have narrow getting short line gazettes all over my house that I read all the time anyway. So, so this is just like having them at work. Um, and so I'd, I'd recommend that. And, and for anybody who, who is interested in the North Coast Pacific Railway, uh, narrow gauge to the Redwoods 
is a phenomenal book and it uh, was by um, Dickinson and Graves and it's still available on Amazon for 32 bucks and it has uh, incredible numbers of photographs and, and track plans and maps. So um, I'm working from that. Very cool. You know, I think you've identified something that we, we need to begin to emphasize in the hobby community, which is you, know, you can't find a realistic prototype for a star cruiser. You have to go to raw model railroading. So, so that's a great insight. Excellent. Yeah, well, I'm going to get my brother into doing uh, buildings, and, and uh, I'm, I'm doing all my buildings on a separate side module so I can transport them separately and it'll hook onto the track module. And that keeps the module width narrow enough to be in the CCCON30 group. And the buildings are like a 15 inch side module. So there will be two 15 inch by six foot uh, town modules. I'm going to see if I can sucker my brother into doing one of them for me. Anyway, that's that's what I got going. Excellent. Anyway, I didn't bring anything up, so I, I'm not going to talk about anything. Anyone else have anything interesting? Yeah, Phil, I've got uh, my uh, last bank is finally repaired. I've got everything but the chip back on. And you see it. It's got an interior. Excellent. And my pride and joy is the loan shark there at his desk. So. Cool. That's uh. I figure out this 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 particular piece has about five thousand miles there on it uh, in the back of my truck as we go around to all the different uh, different shows. <laughs> we have well-traveled it's, buildings. Uh, it's 12 years old. And I, f I figure it would be a little... it, it's got about 5,000 5, miles just going around the Bay Area. <laughs> it literally shook it apart. Yep. Well, everybody's gonna have, everybody has to focus. Everybody have to focus for something for two weeks from now. We'll all have to make a conscious effort uh, to show progress. I have to say that that working on modules that were for the NMRA convention, losing that as a date to focus on, is always a bit of a challenge. I found that last year when we when we lost Concord, I had a bunch of things and it just kind of kind of takes away the focus so now our focus is gonna to have to be to when we get back together in november we'll have to be um, october november it'll be we have to all be all impressive there about what we can bring why don't you impress us with progress for next week or the next oh, yeah, no, I, it, it, we keep making we keep you know but but it's just you know the focus that you get of having a deadline Losing our deadlines, you know, and I'm sure for a lot of folks that were planning on have their layouts open for the convention, they had a whole list of things. These are all the things I want to have done. And now you kind of look at that list and go, eh, do I really need to do that? It's, it's unfortunately a, a deadline is a great motivator, at least for me. So. Yeah, hi, Bill, this is Jim Radke. I haven't been here in a long time, but uh, I didn't know that there was a little present the thing here, but in a couple of weeks, I'll have some nice slides of what I'm doing to my uh, railroad. Absolutely, uh, and it's and by the by the way, you it, I can turn on the the screen share, and so if you take pictures, if you want to take pictures, you can take pictures. The other thing is if if you've got something you really want to show us in detail, if you download the Zoom app to your phone, you can use your phone as a camera in the Zoom app. So you just, you take your phone and you join Zoom, but you flip the camera around to use the camera on the back of the phone, which is generally a very high resolution camera and it has a very short focal distance. And you can do pretty amazing videos with a with a with uh, with an iPhone iPhone or Android camera and join the meeting. So you know, if you've got a really cool model and you'd like us to see it up close, uh, and if you don't know what to do, give me a call, send me an email, I can walk you through it. 
I mean, you can literally, literally, I can, you can be in this meeting like this on your computer and join it from your phone and have a separate second presence in the meeting to show what you're modeling up close. Um, so yeah. it's, it, yeah, this is, this is very much like work for me right now. That's why it's <laughs> up at nine o'clock after a long week, <laughs> but I've got some pretty good pictures that I'd love to share with everybody. But, uh, you know, I wasn't ready to do that today. I don't want to bore everybody trying to well, track it down and everything. So, so, so Jim, though, so since you're on camera, I'm looking over your shoulder at, at what looks like a, uh, um, a loop running around to your room. Is that what I'm seeing? And I'm wondering what that pedestal is that's holding it up. There we go. That's um, got me curious as to this is how my stable office. that is. And I got go. to the point where I had to make the coronavirus Western. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, you can always talk about that. To get a test track in the office, so I didn't have to be freezing out in the garage while you know trying to program an engine or something. Yeah. Well, well, tell me about those pedestals. How does that thing not wobble? Um, they're velcroed, and it, it's okay. just, you know, you can see that I'm sliding under it now in a chair, <laughs> and that's the door to the office right there. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. We just went ahead and you know, started building it. It's been a dream to have it up. I'm, I'm sitting in a nice bay window. I don't know if you remember the house, Charlie. I'm sitting here in the window looking out over the street. So the idea was to be sitting here, you know, watching the world go by while I'm sitting here modeling. But since the coronavirus came, now I've got a monitor on each side to watch the kids and, you know. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. I love it. You know, someday it'll be turned into a nice dispatch office, but, you know. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It looks like a dispatcher station for your life. Yeah, well, when I bought a monitor, uh, I'm a school teacher, if you guys don't know, but when we did this, they said, oh, you'll just look at your little computer and see all your students on there. And I thought, this is, you know, this is stupid. So I went out and bought a nice monitor. A week later, they gave me another monitor. So... <laughs> So I have one ready to go for the railroad. So, but uh, I started rebuilding it. Uh, the coronavirus kind of knocked me into the, into the uh, get off my butt and rip it apart and rebuild it. So now I'm working on lower staging and uh, I just finished building my helix. So I'll have some pictures of that next week. So, excellent. But there's been a lot of fun out there getting busy again. So. And I, I will kind of close with uh, if anyone has an interest in doing something like what George did. So George had some photos. We put them together into a slide presentation. Um, and very much anyone else would like to do the same thing. Give me a give me a buzz, um, you know, and for one of these one of these Saturday events. Uh, and and by the way, on Saturday, the nine o'clock, I, I think based on everything I've heard, I haven't had anyone really asked to move. Um, everyone seemed to like doing this early because you got done and you had the rest of the day. So uh, unless I get a, a kind of an outcry, I'm just going to leave this nine o'clock every other week like we've been doing. Cool. Well, yeah. Unless there's more um, folks would like to share, I think we've kind of come to the end for today. Thanks a lot, Phil. Thanks to everyone. Thank Thanks for doing it, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Thanks couple everybody. Of weeks. We'll see you guys Thank later. You. Good to see some nice faces. Thanks, Phil. Nice to see you, Jim. And welcome back, Jim. Well, Thanks to everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye.